profesor de la Skene University de Malmö. Luego, al final, según vayamos, que vamos un poco mal, intentaremos aprovechar de los dos profesores. Start with the um, scientific evidence. evidence. That's one. Okay. And then it's a round table after that. Okay. And this is it. And the pointer is there. Okay. Everything switched off on. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for being invited in here. It's a great honor for me. And the first thing I noticed when I arrived was uh, the uh, nice architecture of the airport. And I thought that must be something from the famous architect Santiago Calatrava, which has, is also famous in Manda, where I come from, for the turning torso, the big tower, tower 53 floor apartment building there. So. Um, it felt very nice to, to see the um, work of Santiago Calatrava here. And um, it's also a great pleasure for me to speak after Professor Hans Lilia, who I've had a privilege to work together with for many years now. And uh, I've been able to follow his work closely and he's really been committed to, to focus for a long, long time and trying to really make things better using the peace state here for the patient. So unfortunately, there will be some overlap in some of the slides here, but that is, is not, um, it's impossible not to do so because um, I would like to, to put it into context now, how we can use the for this work by Hans Lilja in more a clinical setting. And also to comment on the scientific basis behind the developing this test. So I will then also mention a lot about the 4K, the 4 calcium test, which is now commercially available. So this is all my disclosures. And for those of you who don't know, I'm a urologist in working in Malmö. Um, and I'm focusing a lot on prostate cancer since many, many years. So the problem we have is all the PSA testing all over the world now, and um, this is how many we see in the United States every year. And there are so many biopsies taken, and there's a risk every time you perform biopsy with infections, and uh, people, uh, patients also died from having uh, taking a biopsy. So we should do everything we can to avoid biopsies. And once a biopsy is taken and there's a cancer, as we had heard in the, the um, excellent lecture by Professor Galagaba, Gleason is so important. And we find more and more low-grade cancers that do not um, need any treatment, and perhaps we shouldn't find them. So men having a diagnosis like that should perhaps not ev uh, even go for a biopsy. So, and this was also mentioned in the, pre by the previous, in the previous talk, um, the recommendation that came in first in 2008 with the U.S. Task Force recommendation, and this was uh, to not screen men 75 years old or older, and then a few years later, they were even more advocating that you should not screen, and this was, of course, based on the PCLO, the American Screening Trial. So, and... There's been a lot of criticism against this, and there will be some bad consequences about stop taking the PSA test. 
So this is quite the opposite, the recommendation here in Europe, which is more influenced by the European screening trials, of course, that, and this was published uh, three years ago now, European Urology, by a steering group in the EIU, and they recommended that uh, a baseline C serum PSA should instead be offered to men very early, perhaps even as early as 40 to 35. So here you have a, a very interesting conflict between the European view and the American view. So, and what are the consequences that we know today from the US task force recommendation? Well, there is a clear decrease in number of PSA tests and biopsies as been reported recently in Journal of Urology, like a 28% decrease in the incidence of prostate cancer. And even more recent paper in JAMA by Jamal Thal showed that, um, well, they again showed clearly numbers of reduced biopsies and diagnosis, but they recommend that we must, we need longer follow-up time to see whether there will be an effect on mortality. Because it has been criticized a lot that if you don't take the PSA test, you're gonna miss a lot of uh, lethal cancers, dangerous cancers. And that's what the problem we have today. So the question we have today with PSA testing and new tests is of course how to find the dangerous cancer at an early stage. So the strategy then to find aggressive cancers early is of course put together all the information about the patient, even if DRE is not always reliable, we should not forget about it. And we should try to really identify the high risk cancers and avoid the endless cancer. So PSA is probably not good enough as a single test, we need better tests. So if we go to the European guidelines, and so what do we have there about PSA and different forms of PSA? Well, first it says that PSA has revolutionized prostate cancer diagnosis, and that's no doubt about that. And if you look at it as an independent variable, it's actually better than DRE and or transrectal ultrasonography trust to detect prostate cancers. And there are also a table here at the different PSA levels and the risk of having prostate cancer, how it increased clearly by PSA level, and also the risk of having a more dangerous uh, cancer defined as at least Gleason 7. So what about following PSA over time, which we can talk about PSA velocity or PSA doubling time, may have a prognostic role, but then, in patient after treatment, after prostatectomy or radiotherapy, not that much in the diagnostic setup. So um, they are not really recommended to be in the diagnostic setup of prostate cancer. So coming back to different forms of PSA, and this is Landmark's paper by Hans Lilia group already in 1991, and it was the similar time from Ulf Hockan Steinmann in Helsinki. Papers showing that if you look at percent free PSA in blood together with total PSA, you'll get more information whether there's a prostate cancer or not. And there has been a lot of papers showing the value of, of looking at the free form of PSA, and it was also summarized in the meta-analysis European Urology more than 10 years ago. And this was part of the NHS Prostate Cancer Risk Management Program United, in the United Kingdom. And the conclusion was that there is actually a rationale for using total PSA and free to total, uh, uh, or complex PSA, which was a similar test then. So there already more than 10 years ago, there was a recommendation to use more than single, more than total PSA. Another paper came from one of the big groups in Euro Europe, the Hamburg group, first author Jochen Waltz, and they again show here in the form of a nomogram that you could add percent of free PSA to 
to in the, to in the, the uh, diagnostic set of the prostate cancer. And as uh, Dr. Lille mentioned also, in a group of patients with PSA just below the level of three, that has been used a lot as a cutoff. So um, then, this paper was also mentioned by Dr. Lillian. It came from, from Malmo, where we collected almost, one th uh, almost 800 patients before having the first biopsy. And the interesting thing with this study compared to other studies we've heard about is that we have been using free PSA and total PSA for many years now. So, and we have taken that into account when you make decisions on biopsy or not. So the question was, if we are already using total PSA and free PSA, how much will the four calorie friend panel then add? Is that useful to have a test with four instead of two components in and together with H and DRE? And yes, the full model here shows an area under the curve of almost 0.8. So there is an increased value of using more than two forms of PSA if you study a population-based cohort like in MAMA. So what, are, what can we then use today? Well, we mentioned the four K-score test, which is now commercially available by OPCO. And this is the four calorie panel developed by Hans Lillian. And it's also in the base, in the full model here, H, DRE, and prior biopsy status, previous negative biopsies also included. So there you get a score. And the score is then in percent risk of finding a, a prostate cancer, leaves on seven or more on a biopsy. So it means that this is to find important cancers. So, um, Percent of risk of having aggressive prostate cancer defines as at least least a seven. So this is how the algorithm is built. So what are the scientific evidence that this test is good? Well, you heard a lot already in the previous talk about this, that the test is designed and it's based on many publications that it should identify those cancers that we really would like to find. So more than 2,000 men have been included in these studies and at least 12 clinical studies. And the test is now recommended by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network in the United States in their guideline as a test. So, um, there are a number of retrospective studies, but now also prospective studies, both in Europe and the United States, to validate the test in the clinical setting. And you, it's already ma mentioned, the European screening test, the PROTECT Swedish studies, and there is also a validation test in the United States. And this is again a list of all the tests. More than 20,000 men have been included to confirm the accuracy of this test. This paper was also mentioned. This is from Malmo, the prevent medicine, with, uh, which clo in this paper, the main conclusion was that if you have men with a level of three or more, but defined as a low risk, um, so, uh, they are unlikely, if you have uh, three, around three, PSA around three, and you find that this body panel is a low risk cancer, then the risk is very, very small to develop incurable mm -hmm. prostate cancer. And then it was validated with at least large study from Northern Sweden, the West Balkan study. So if we look here, the area under the curve, um, different screening population from Göteborg, from France, from Rotterdam, and unscreened patients, previously screened patients. You see in each case here uh, uh, high numbers in the area under the curve. So uh, six separate pre biopsy cohorts, more than 7,500 men. We find an excellent discrimination for high-grade prostate cancer. 
And then more important is also how many biopsies you can avoid by using these four calcium and the uh, test. Um, well, it's about from 50% here, and in one case here, pre prior negative biopsy in the ROT screening trial, you can avoid a lot of biopsies. So this is what we can look at as scientific evidence because there are a number of studies now published in highly ranked journals and focusing on this four current panel and how it can be used in a clinical setting. So to conclude, I think we can all agree that the simple PSA test is no longer appropriate in the modern setting of prostate cancer diagnostics. There is a great need for better blood tests, especially to identify the aggressive cancers that we need to find. And there are validated studies now on the use of the commercial form or the four calibrant test. And more importantly, we need to reduce the number of biopsies to avoid uh, dangerous complications. So, thank you very much for your attention.